Oh, yeah, she's, she's going to. She's going to. All right, we're on quick. So we're back in our, I uh, know we've had a couple of weeks off, and I'm glad, I'm so thankful that, you, that you're that you here, and I know that, that others will be uh, tuning in online. I want to encourage you, if you are tuning in online, is to, if you're feeling better, um, there's nothing like a little fellowship. You know, we need it. We need more fellowship with the church. So uh, I'm always here at 5.30 on Sunday evenings to try to get a good 25 minutes or so sitting around and just talking about different things. And uh, and I and I kind of keep my eye on stuff like that and, you know, always try to get here 30 minutes uh, before, especially Sunday morning, you know, get here quite a bit early just to have some time with the church, you know, to fellowship. And uh, it, it's it's important ask questions get to know each other and so I, I know I'm glad that we have the Facebook live that you can you can follow along with our lessons but I don't want you to miss that fellowship with the church so be thinking about that <coughs> excuse me and pray about that and and, uh, and try to come back and join us on our Sunday evening and Wednesday evening services now back to 2nd Samuel chapter 23 so let me catch you back up David is at the end of his life oh David we all know about David even the kids know King David what did Golly, what did King David do when the young? What do you know about David? What did he do with the? What was he famous for? What did he sling in his? With the slingshot. What did he do with the slingshot? What did he do? Did he kill Goliath? You remember that story? What about Brooklyn, you remember that story? David killed Goliath. You weren't here. <laughs> I think I called her. I called her by her wrong name. I'm sorry. Well, David's at the end of his life. Uh, the last time we were here, we studied David's song. David cries out from his heart. He cries out from a broken heart, but a thankful heart. And I wrote that down because I know that you Christians can do that. We can cry out to the Lord with a broken heart and at the same time, a thankful heart. Can we not? Because even though you may be broken over something, or hurting over something, you can always what? Think of the blessings. You can always think of the, the blessings. I've been reminded of that heavily today, that even though your heart can be broken, you can see the promises of God and there's joy. There's always joy in the midst of pain as a Christian. Now, the unbelievers, they won't understand that. But those who know God, like David knew God, can always cry out with a broken heart but a thankful heart. David told us in, in that song, really, the theme of it was without God, he would be nothing. And uh, of course, I shared that song with you last time. Without him, I would be nothing. You know, like a ship lost at sea. You, you can't do anything apart from Christ. David was a man after God's own heart. Why? What did we learn? Because God made him that way. That was God's choice. David is a picture of the church. David's also a picture of Christ. God never looks down from heaven upon a good person and then says, I'll show that one some grace. That's not how it works. And I stressed that this morning too. You need to understand that. God, as we learned in Isaiah, as we learned uh, back with Noah before the flood, God looks down on what? Sinners. There's none good, no not one. You can try all your life to be good, and you can do a lot of good things, but the standard that God has set is perfection. So God is judging you based on a perfect standard, meaning Zero sin. So if anybody wants to try to come to God by being good, then you've got to come to God showing Him, proving to Him that you never did one little thing wrong in your whole entire life. And it's not possible. No one can do that. So God doesn't look upon good people and then says, I'm going to show you some grace. God looks upon people who are rejecting Him, who, want, who do not want Him, would never seek for Him, and He pours His grace out upon them, and then they come to Him. Grace always comes before repentance. And if everybody knew that, there would be unity in the church. There wouldn't be all these denominations. I promise you that. That one statement there is the reason that we have thousands of denominations and boo of different religions in the world. Because they don't understand the grace of God. That grace comes first. God begins the good work in us. David knew it. And in the end of David's life here, he makes sure to give credit where credit is due. He makes sure that the truth is told. Now, you know, we all have a story, don't we? We all have a story. And some, are, some of you may be better than David. Some of you 
could probably stand before God and, and God would say, well done, good and faithful servant. And he could actually look back upon your life and say, you know what? You did a lot of, you did better than David. Some of you might say, oh no, I'm worse than David. Okay? We all have our own different opinions, our own different ideas and different experiences. But I see a valuable lesson here in David's life. And that is, after all of these studies, that when we trust God and we walk with Him, we will always see His grace and His blessing. I promise you that. It's so easy to walk away from God, isn't it? To go our own way. But when you stay true to God, when you walk with Him, now you're going to go through the trials like we're learning about on Sunday morning, but if you stay with God, if you walk with God, you will see His blessings and you'll always see His grace. Now look at verse 1 of 2 Samuel 23. Now, this gonna, we're only going to really expound on the first half of this tonight because the second half, he's just naming out all of his warriors, and I'm not going to read all of that. We're not going to sit and talk about all of these warriors, so I'm not going to bore you all with that. If you all really want to sit and study all of David's valiant men, mighty warriors, and read those names, then you can go do that on your own, but I'm not going to do that to you. So I'm going to leave you a few minutes extra tonight. Uh, if you've got some questions about some things you've learned about David or anything that you have, we'll have a little Q&A time at the end. So let's move through these. It says, now these are the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, declares. The man who was raised on high declares. The anointed of the God of Jacob and the sweet psalmist of Israel. Now, these are not, when he says these are the last words of David, this is not meaning his, the last final few words that he says like he's on his deathbed. This is his last public statement to people. These are his last comments recorded. Some theologians are not sure that David actually penned these, but someone wrote them a little bit later, the final things that David had said. But regardless, these are the words of David. In 1 Kings 2.1, we know David's final words. They're to his son, Solomon, which generally speaking through history, when a man is dying, wouldn't his children be around him? And he gives his final words, as my friend was telling me. He uh, was gathered around his father uh, a couple of days ago and, and had his final conversation with his father. And I've been thinking about that ever since talking to him. Can you imagine your final words with your father? Some people didn't get final words with their father. You know, some people do. Well, David stands in 1 Kings 2.1. Let's look at this on the screen. As David's time to draw, as David's time to die drew near, he charged Solomon, his son, saying, I'm going the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore, and show yourself a man. Keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his ordinances, and his testimony, according to what is written in the law of Moses, that you may succeed in all that you do and wherever you turn, so that the Lord may carry out his promise which he spoke concerning me, saying, If your sons are careful of their way, to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. Now this is David's <clears throat> final words to his son, but what we're reading tonight is really his official statement, his last public words to his people. So look at verse 2. It says, what does David say? David says, The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and his word was on my tongue. This is another reference you guys can use to how do we know what these words in the Bible, how did they get there? And I've been clear in this church in teaching you that all Scripture, the Bible says in Timothy, is inspired by God. It's literally breathed out by God. God spoke through the prophets and through the apostles. And every single word written that we read is from God. It's not as the world wants to think that they were angry men or just men who just wanted to write down their opinions and everybody's supposed to follow. No, 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 no. Every word in that Bible is from God. He spoke through men. It's what David's saying here. The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me. Now, you and I will never understand inspired writing, right? God doesn't speak through us like that. The Bible says in Hebrews that God spoke to us in the last days through His Son. The last time that God spoke to mankind was through Jesus Christ. There is no more revelation from God. and You will never meet a person in this life who will come to you with a word that God told them. If they do, you reject that. 
Why, do you, why are you so passionate about that, Derek? Because if someone comes up with a new word of the Lord, then we've got to throw the Bible away. And we've got to turn and listen to him. So what did God say? And he also, if he's going to tell you something that God said, he's got to perform signs and wonders. Because the rest of them did. God confirmed his apostles and his prophets through signs and wonders and miracles. And they gave prophecies. Near prophecies and far prophecies. So that every word, every word of the book of the Bible, the 66 books of the Bible, and I'm about to chase this little rabbit. Y'all just hold on a second. But we need to understand why we got the 66 books. Why did the Catholics add others? And why do people say there was missing books or lost books? And we found them. You know, Tom Hanks was in the movie. We found the lost. No, you didn't find any lost books. The first church, okay, the first couple of hundred years, they knew about every writing. They looked at the, what we have today and they said, these are the inspired writings. How did they know? Because they harmonized with all the other inspired writings. When you go read the books of Thomas and the books of Joseph and all these different books that these people wrote, or the Apocrypha, you will see that they are different than what we have in our 66 books. They're not the same. It won't take you much of understanding the Bible to be able to see that, okay? So I just had to spin off for a minute there and say, David is saying that the Spirit of the Lord spoke by me. When we read in the Psalms, when we read in <clears throat> Proverbs, when we read the things that David wrote, he's saying that God wrote it. God spoke through me, okay? So that's why, hey, let me give you a practical application. When a baby dies, and the preacher says what? The baby's in heaven. Some of you may go home and say, how does he know the baby's in heaven? How do we use the Bible to show that a baby goes to heaven? David, speaking under the inspiration of God, when his own child died, David said, the child can't come to me, but I can go to the child. Okay, that's the passage that we use to show that David's baby will be where David's going to go. Now, that, where did Nathan tell David? You're good with God, right? You belong to God. You're going to heaven. And David did. We read that later in the New Testament. David died, and he was buried, and he went to Sheol, just like Abraham did, just like Moses did, just like his fathers did. He just told his son Solomon, right? I've got to go the way that our fathers go. David died and went to the grave. And that until Jesus Christ ascended on high, and then he took the captives with him. He took David and Abraham and Moses, and all of them ascended into heaven together. Now, when you and I die, we die tonight, we don't go to Sheol. We don't go to the grave. We go instantly where? In the presence of the Lord. In heaven. That's where Jesus is at. Why didn't David go to heaven when he died? Because Jesus hadn't died on the cross yet. You can't go into heaven unless there's an eternal sacrifice that's been applied to your life, right? So once Jesus died on the cross, you now have an eternal atonement on you, those who believe in Jesus. Now, if you step up and say, well, I believe in Jesus. Well, it's like we're going to learn in James. Even the devil believes in Jesus and the demons, and they tremble at his name. Are they in heaven? No. So what's the difference? Your belief has to be a commitment to following Christ. I will follow Christ. I will obey him. That kind of belief. It's not a simple intellectual. No, oh, well, yeah, if, if you tell me I got to believe in Jesus to go to heaven, all right, I believe. But I'm going to run with the world. No, because you didn't truly obey his commands, right? That's why Jesus cries out in Luke 6, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I'm saying? So, well, that was a mouthful, but I think it's important to get that David is not just saying this. He says, the spirit of the Lord spoke by me, okay? <clears throat> From a young shepherd boy who faced that giant, I want you to think back to him as I finish up here. I want you to think back to the young man who killed his 10,000. Remember the women were crying out, oh, Saul kills his thousands, but David, he kills 10,000. David's a man, right? And they were all after David. Then we get to the man who <clears throat> committed adultery with Bathsheba. Well, how did you feel that night when you read that? Here we had David up, you know, we held him so high. We loved David, didn't we? We just loved old David, his, his, his bravery. You know, we loved that description of David, that ruddy, that ruddy little face he had, and just so sweet, just a sweet young man. He was brave. And then he went and did what he did with Bathsheba. <clears throat> then he had her husband killed. He just made things worse. 
Then we read about the David who went and hid in the caves while he was a king. He's a king of Israel hiding in caves. What happened, David? We read about a, the David who didn't protect his own daughter. When Ammon raped his daughter Tamar, he didn't protect her, did he? And then even after that, he didn't punish his son like he should have. Yet through all of that, through all of David's good and all of David's bad, who was always there with him? The Lord was always with him. If he was there with David, you think he'll be there for you? Listen to this. Put it up on Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, shall not want. Y'all think of this. Think on these words. Read these words with me, understanding that David had failed the Lord. David had done wrong, but David loved the Lord. Do you love the Lord? Read these words like David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, <clears throat> I fear no evil, for you are with me. You know, now while we read this to people at their bedside when they're dying, right? To remind them of what? The Lord is with you. I remember telling Lisa Finkley's mother right before she passed that we were there, and, and I said, it, you don't have to be afraid. You're going to close your eyes, and you're going to see him. You're going to see him, and you're going to be so happy when you see him. Just think on that. You know, you just got to let go of this world. Just let go. It's okay. He's not going to let you fall. He's not going to let you hurt. He's going to take you straight with him, and you're going to be so blessed. And I can remember seeing the joy, and I can see the joy in the room. You know, I mean, I just know that's why we read this, that he will, that he will be with you. He said, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. And I love how he closes it. David said, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Do you have that confidence? Hey, take me out of here. I don't care because I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I believe that. I believe that. Verse 3, David says, The God of Israel said, The rock of Israel spoke to me. He who rules over men righteously who rules in the fear of God, is as the light of the morning when the sun rises, a morning without clouds, when the tender grass springs out of the earth, through sunshine after rain. Truly is not my house so with God, for he has made an everlasting covenant with me, ordered in all things and secured. For all my salvation and all my desire, will he not indeed make it grow? I love, made my mind think of what Isaiah said. He told Isaiah, I am God, and there is no other. He said, have I not said, will I not do it? Guys, everything God said in his word is a promise. We can trust in him. That's why we don't grieve. Remember, I keep saying that today. I don't know why, I guess it's, it's appropriate that I'm talking about it today. But we have this confident hope. It's not like, well, I hear everybody talking about Jesus. I hear everybody talking about heaven. I sure hope it's real. It's not that kind of hope. It's an absolute. I know Jesus is real because of what he said in the Bible. Now, if, all, if you don't know the Bible, if all you know is somebody told me we go to heaven when we die, you're not going to really believe that you're going to go to heaven when you die because you don't trust him. The only way you can trust him is to really know him, and the only way you really know him is in his word. And the more that you get into his word and you read those promises, you read those prophecies, you see all those things that come true. Then when he says to be absent from the body is present with the Lord, you're like, I know. I know I'm going to be with the Lord. I'm ready, Lord. It's like my friend, when he died, he laid there. He's ready to go. Like, he closed his eyes. He had to actually open up his one eye and it's like, what's taking so long? I thought that was so funny. His son, it gets to go the rest of his days with a joy on his father's deathbed. He's got a joy that my daddy went out with something funny. How could he go out with something funny? Because he knew where he was going. He was excited about it. David knew when the Lord spoke to him. He says here, who is this everlasting king he's talking about? Can y'all name who the everlasting king is? Jesus, right? The Lord Jesus. 
How do we know he's the everlasting king? Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 9, we'll read this at Christmas every year, don't we? For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. Get that? There will be no end to the increase of his government or of his peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and when how long does heaven last forevermore the Lord Jesus will rule and reign in his kingdom forevermore how is that possible and Isaiah says the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this he said will he not indeed make it grow David knew who God was, and he knew that God is going to keep his promises. He knew that God never broke a single one before. And you know, David loved the Lord, and that is why we see such a big difference in him compared to what we've seen in Saul and what we'll learn from Solomon later. David just wanted to be with the Lord. Now Solomon, we'll read, and Solomon had a lot of peace. Solomon had a good reign. Solomon loved the Lord. But Solomon, really, what did he do when he went to God? What did he ask God for? He wanted, he wanted more knowledge. He wanted to be able to rule the people better. David just wanted to be with the Lord. David just wanted to be with the Lord. There's a difference there. Psalm 84.10. Here's a, this gives you the heart of David. Let me show you a great passage here of what David said. David said, For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Would y'all settle to be a doorkeeper in the house of God? I would. I would. Verse 6 says, But the worthless, every one of them will be thrust away like thorns, because they cannot be taken in hand. But the man who touches them must be armed with iron and the shaft of a spear, and they will be completely burned with fire in their place. David always could use these types of uh, imagery because he had spent, you know, some people call him a, a man of war, you know, a man of blood. David had learned the hard way on a lot of things. David saw a lot of violence. David saw a lot of dead men. But David learned through all of that what he's saying here is that God will destroy the wicked. But I want you to understand something. God said in the Bible that I, he said, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God loves his creation tells us that in Jude. God loves his creation, even the fallen angels, you know. And, and God doesn't, it, 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 he doesn't, he doesn't want you to sin. He doesn't want you to be wicked, okay? But he will destroy the wicked. Because why? Because he keeps his promises. He keeps his promises to the ones who believe in him, the ones who have faith in him, that you will have eternal life with him. You will be with him. But to the ones who reject him, the ones who want this present world, he will give you a life without him. I've always told people, those that go to hell, he's going to be saying to them, your will be done. That's what you wanted. Jesus said in John 3, the light is coming to the world, but men love what? Darkness. That's why they go to hell, because they don't want God. They don't want Christ in their life. They love darkness. So in the end, he's going to say, your will be done. I'm going to give you what you've always wanted. You wanted a life without me. You didn't want my restraint. You didn't want my judgment. You didn't want to hear anything about me through my word. So guess what? You don't have to hear anything about me for the rest of eternity. I'm going to cat. In fact, you won't even have light because without me, there is no light. People think they're going to party in hell. That's the biggest lie, the biggest foolish statement you ever heard in your life. You ain't going to be with anybody in hell. It's going to be complete isolation and pitch dark and suffering and torment and it will never end. How do I know it will never end? Because Jesus, God, said the worm will never die. You're in a place, that's the imagery that nothing dies in hell. There is no such thing as total annihilation like the Jehovah's Witness teach you, okay? He said the worm will never die. When we leave these bodies, we only go to a different state. We either go to eternity in heaven or we go to the grave, ultimately be cast into the outer fire, into the lake of fire with the devil and his demons. And David says here that they will 
be destroyed. Now, the rest of the passage here, David goes on and he begins to describe all of the memories. And I'm not going to go through all of these, but y'all can look back at them yourself. But what, they're, what he's doing is he's, as I said in the beginning tonight, David is giving credit where credit is due. He goes out on his final saying, I want you guys to hear about these valiant men. Think about David fighting all those Philistines and all those Amalekites all those years, right? Who was always with him? The Lord. But who else was with him? Those valiant men. Now, you might remember back in 1 Samuel, he met these valiant men, and they were, they were wounded, they were weary, they were hungry, they were without water, and David took them in, and then guess what they did? They stayed with David. They stayed faithful to David, and they believed in David. In fact, look at this last little example here. Um, it says that they, these men, when David said, and look at verse 16, Pat, can you put up verse 16? Or if you've got your Bibles open, look at verse 16. Uh, oh, actually, I'm sorry, verse 15. Put up verse 15 first. There you go. David had a craving and said, Oh, that someone would give me water to drink from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. Now, why is Bethlehem so important to him? Where's his mind at? Where are most old men's mind at when they're passing away, when they're going? Where does it go back to? Home. It's going back home. Where did he grow up at? Bethlehem. David's from Bethlehem, okay? He's from the seed of Jesse. He's Jesse's son, and Jesse was a Bethlehemite, all right? However you say it. He says, oh, I wish that I could get some water from back home. That's what he's saying. Well, then look at verse 16. So three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines and drew water from the well of Bethlehem, which was by the gate, and took it and brought it to David. Can you imagine that? Hey, are you one of those people? Hey, man, David's my leader. David's my, the anointed king. I'll follow David anywhere he goes. I love David with all my heart. I've given my life to follow David. And David says to you, Jackson, boy, I'm so thirsty. I wish I had some water. I know Jackson's heart. You'd go get him that water, wouldn't you? You'd have left. And, and these three men, they did that. They went straight into danger to go get David that water he wanted. Well, when David saw what they did, it says here, when he saw, uh, shall I drink the blood? of the men who went in jeopardy of their lives. Therefore, he would not drink it. These things, the three mighty men. Why didn't he drink the water? Why wouldn't David drink that water? Here's what I think. David knew what those men had risked. David didn't feel worthy of that kind of sacrifice. Only God deserves that kind of sacrifice in his mind. Because David knew. Remember, I'm telling you, he's writing his final, his swan song, right? He's fighting his final words. He looks back over his life. He sees his iniquity. He sees his weakness. But he saw what? Who was always with him? Who always upheld him by his right hand? God did. David's like, I don't want you men to go do that for me. In fact, I'm going to take that water and I'm going to pour it out for the Lord. He's the one that deserves all the credit. He's the one that deserves your sacrifice. David never wanted the men to love him like that. David, like any good shepherd, he wants the men, it's like me today. I don't want you to love me. Well, I want you to love me as far as I, I mean, just because we're human and I want you to love me. But who am I always trying to point you to? I want you to love Christ. I want you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's all I want for you. If, if I was on my deathbed tonight and I've got my family or church, whoever's around me, that's what I'm going to be telling you. Love the Lord your God. Walk with him just like David told Solomon. And then he goes on to read, rest of those names. Let me tell you what Spurgeon said here in closing. These men, all of these men, these valiant, 37 and all men that he mentions here, even, he even mentions Uriah, right? Bathsheba's husband. David just goes through, he just lays it all out. Look, here's the truth of my life. Might as well, because God's put it in Scripture forever. How would you like for God to put your life in Scripture for everybody to read later? To tell all of your iniquities, all of your sins, just write it out in a book there where everybody can read it later. Would you like that, Kylie? you like, well, yeah, I wouldn't either. But Spurgeon says, these men came to David when his fortunes were at the lowest ebb, and he himself was regarded as a rebel and an outlaw. Remember running from Saul? And they remained faithful to him throughout their lives. Now listen to this. Happy are they who can follow a good cause in its worst estate for theirs is true glory. What are we learning on Sunday morning, guys? Trials are coming upon you. 
He says, count it all what? Joy. What did Spurgeon say? After you're you, if you follow Christ, no matter what, through the ups and the downs, through the bad trials that are coming, you keep your eyes on Christ, you keep following Him, you will receive that crown of glory, that unfaded crown of glory Paul talks about, right, in Corinthians. Do you know that each of us as born-again Christians, that our lives have meaning? We are all a part of this bigger plan that God has orchestrated. There's something happening in Australia tonight. Some young 15-year-old girl in Australia that loves Jesus, that God has got a hold of. Her. And somehow, that life that, that's there in Australia tonight may be intertwined with a life that's in Texas tonight. Later, years down the road, and God may join them together, and they may be a beautiful blessing. I don't know. You have no idea how your lives, sitting right here in Asheville City, are going to be used in this big picture, this big plan that God is working. But what do we know about God's plan? What is He doing? What is He orchestrating for the church? He's working all things together for good. Your obedience and faithfulness to God will always matter. Why? Because it's a part of a bigger plan. So if you ever get tired, if you ever get weak and say, I'm just so tired, I just want to rest, don't forget God's counting on you. The greater church is counting on you. So when you lay down, you think the battle's going to stop? You think the enemy, Satan's going to say, whoop, time out, Justin's tired, let me just stop, let me stop attacking the church because Justin's tired. He don't do that, does he? As soon as he sees a Christian get tired, a Christian get weak, What's he going to do? What did these Philistines do? You know what David learned through all those battles? That those valiant men never gave up, did they? Even when David gave up and he went to go hide, when he went to run, these men didn't give up, did they? Why? Because they had done seen wickedness. They had done seen a life without Christ. They had done seen a life without following God. But when they saw David and they saw David's God who was faithful to David, they wanted to be on that side. And that's why David's giving them credit. In the end, that's what we see in David's mighty men, that they learned from David's courage and they followed David. Even when David got weak, they maintained what they had learned from him. They were always there, ready to fight, never left his side. Why? Because God had touched each of their lives. And it's only right in his final comments that he praises the faithfulness of these men who stood by him. You know what the Lord Jesus will do for you? He's going to praise you before His Father. Because remember, I even said that this morning. If you will not profess Jesus before men on earth, then He will not profess you, what? Before the Father. Meaning what? If you do profess Jesus before men on earth, He will what? He will profess you before the Father. Isn't that amazing? Can you just imagine the scene to get to heaven and Jesus says, Hey, Hannah, hey, God, this is Hannah. Come here, Hannah. She's mine. Hey, God, there's Brady. Remember Brady when we dunked him, when we baptized him in the river up there? And he's mine. He belongs to me. Can y'all wait for that? Can you imagine the Lord Jesus announcing you to God the Father? What a beautiful sight, right? All right. Well, I hope that's encouraging to you tonight. We got one more lesson with David next week and then we'll close up our study of First and Second Samuel and then I'll uh, let you in on the secret on what we're going to do next. Anybody got any comments or questions about David? Anybody excited about going to heaven? <laughs> Be every hand in the house. Anybody got anything at all tonight? <laughs>